Welcome to this Talks at Google virtual event. I'm Jenny Mizusawa, and I'm the head of the Exchange Platforms team in GTech Professional Services and on the Mix Googlers leadership team. Before we get started, I want to remind the audience that we'll be taking questions towards the end of this talk. As you think of questions throughout the conversation, please be sure to add them in the live chat on the right. I am very excited to introduce today's guest, J. Kenji Lopez-Alt. Kenji is a chef, a parent, a best-selling author of the Food Lab, children's book, Every Night is Pizza Night, a wildly popular New York Times food columnist, and the host of Kenji's Cooking Show with over a million subscribers on YouTube. March 8th, his third book, dedicated to the science and technique of cooking in a walk, The Walk, Recipes and Techniques, debuted. Kenji, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Talks at Google. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. Awesome. <laughs> So one of the things that, you know, as I was going through the <clears> book <throat> and I was talking with the other folks in Mix Googlers ERG is that many of the members of our group identified intercultural cooking as one of their favorite things about being Mix. And I really mm -hmm. like how in your book you talk about, you know, your introduction in the walk being in 80s infomercials, which I deeply identify right. with, <laughs> <laughs> going to Chinatown with your dad and your mom making gyoza. So maybe you could talk a little about how Mix played a role in your cooking and the way you think about food in this book in particular. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I had a sort of, I think, interesting upbringing um, food wise related to food because so my mom is Japanese um, and she came uh, to the US when she was um, a teenager when she was uh, 16. Um, and then her parents came later on. Um, but I grew up uh, in um, I grew up in New York with my living with my mom uh, and my grandparents, uh, my Japanese grandparents uh, on the floor below. We lived in 10J. They lived in 9J. Um, and uh, Japanese was my first language. And so we, we ate a lot of Japanese food growing up because my mom would cook Japanese food. My grandparents, uh, my grandmother didn't speak any English and she only cooked Japanese food. Um, but we also ate a lot of sort of, uh, my mom would cook a lot of American stuff like Betty Crocker, New York Times mm -hmm. recipes, things like that. Um, I think partly because, you know, she moved here when she was a teenager, but also I think she wanted to introduce us to more sort of standard American um, and American adjacent uh, stuff. Um, so, you know, my, my, as, as a result, like we didn't really, you know, the only real sort of family recipes that I had growing up were two things, um, gyoza that my mom mm -hmm. made, um, and then Japanese mapo tofu, mabo, mabo, mabo tofu. Um, and those were like the only two sort of real family recipes and everything else was kind of just like, Either my grandmother would cook something, but I wouldn't like, I didn't ever, never really learned Japanese, how to cook Japanese food from her. I just kind of ate it. Um, yeah. Or, um, you know, or it would be something new that my mom just read about, like read, read in the New York Times or whatever it is. Um, and uh, so I think like a lot of, I think a lot of, like a lot of people in my um, generation who um, uh, I, I didn't learn, I didn't grow up learning how to cook like from my grandparents or from my mother or whatever. So by the time I was in college, like I wasn't, I didn't really cook much. Um, and in fact, my main cooking influence at that time was my, my dad, um, who is uh, from Western Pennsylvania. He's, um, you know, his, his family goes back a few generations in the U S um, and he's from Western Pennsylvania. Uh, but he was super into um, Chinese food growing up. And so he would um, take us around like Chinatown every weekend in New York and in Boston. Um, and then, um, uh, and then on weekends, you know, every, every couple times a month, he would cook like these big Chinese um, feasts. And so most, and, and that was when I was involved <laughs> in cooking because I, on, on weekdays, I was like, you know, practicing violin and doing all these things that Asian kids do. And my, so my mom would cook dinner. So I never cooked dinner. I never cooked with my mom, but on weekends um, was when my dad would cook um, and he would have us help him. So whatever, picking cilantro leaves, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, uh, and so most of my cooking experience growing up was um, cooking like Chinese or Mexican food from like, and learning how to do it from my dad who was white and uh, yeah. was learning it, <laughs> learning it um, in turn from like books and also from, you know, he spent a lot of time meeting chefs and talking to cooks at, at, at various restaurants around. Um, and so that, that was sort of my experience growing up. Um, so I, I guess, I mean, all that is to say that, um, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> I didn't grow up with a specifically, a specific strong food culture. Um, and as a result, like, I think a lot of my writing tends to be across the spectrum, you know, like I, I don't feel like mm -hmm. a very strong connection to one specific cuisine. If, if it's, if it's anything, it would be like, you know, the type, the type of food I grew up eating in New York, which is Chinese, Chinese American and, mm -hmm. uh, 
pizza, and, you know, yeah. those types of things and like New York foods. Um, so that that's really sort of my um, my food culture, um, you know, which I think is sort of also, you know, emblematic of, of a mixed race kid growing up in a big city, you know, big, you know, a city like New York, where you have access to all these different types, all these different cuisines and all these ingredients and all, all these different things. So I kind of have a general interest in, in all that stuff. Yeah. I think, you know, as someone who's also mixed Japanese and white, um, you know, you do find that you end up getting all these different things and you kind of mishmash it together, right? So we've had right. a, uh, you know, Korean dry cleaner in our town and they would give us chap chai. And not that like anybody in our family was Korean, but we were the ones near them, you know? And right, so right, right. that becomes part <laughs> of your story. You know, one of the things I really like actually in your <clears throat> book that um, actually my sister and I talked about was mm -hmm. in you talk about making the pizza and that it's not a family recipe but it's a family recipe because it came from the back of a you know a bag, bag of flour, flour. <laughs> right and it's like and you kind of touch on that like the only japanese you know japanese there's mapo tofu and the gyuza but like still that is an authentic recipe to your family and i really mm -hmm. i really like that and so thinking about that like when you think about your kids there's those traditional things you hand down but then also right. what are the memories that you make with them now right. and it's interesting because you know my wife is colombian from colombia and her family everyone in her family like she's the only person who let like her brothers and sisters and their kids and her um, aunts and uncles and her parents they all like live within like a two block radius of where they grew up and they still all live there in bogota um and so you know my so my wife associates very strongly with colombian food and with um, and, and that's her culture. Um, and so, you know, so at home now with our kids, uh, we have a five-year-old and, and now a seven-month-old. Um, but um, we cook, you know, if we, we cook a lot of Colombian food, um, especially sort of like food from the Andes. So like a lot of soups and beans and stuff like that. Um, but then we also, you know, mix it with a lot of, well, a lot of stuff cooked in a wok and, and sort of a whole bunch of like all the cross-cultural stuff that um, I grew up eating. So um, yeah, I'll be interested to, to know like when my daughter grows up, like what, what she'll consider um, her food culture to be. I mean, like, I know that she'll feel a strong association to certain Colombian dishes. Um, she'll probably also, you know, feel an association to mapo. Like, the, I make the same mapo tofu mm -hmm. that my mom used to make. I make that for my daughter, and that's one of her favorite foods also. Um, but, you know, but now it's like she's growing up in Seattle, which is, like, very different from right. where, you know, the, the food scene is really different from New York. And it's like, so she grows up um, eating eating like raw oysters and, and salmon all the time. <laughs> I grew up eating, but, um, um, so yeah, it, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens to her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure it'll all be good. I mean, I think that for kids now, when I see, now that I live in New York, uh, yeah. you know, they, they have exposure to so much, right. And they have such like interesting, broad, you know, taste palettes for being like your mm -hmm. friends, you know, five-year-old. Who's, yeah, yeah. You know, and <laughs> it's really it's I think it's fantastic that you can get all of those things together and you're seeing more of that especially even in the children's books exactly like talking about your neighborhood yeah. and who has you know different foods doesn't necessarily mean your best food for you and right 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 yeah process. I mean the, the children's book um you know I grew up in New York my um my partner my um illustrating partner for the children's book um Gianna she um, is from Philadelphia. Uh, and so, you know, both, um, both of us grew up in, in city, in cities and, and, you know, originally part of, part of the original, the original idea for the book was going to be about a kid who sort of travels around the world and eats mm -hmm. all these different foods. Um, you know, the story would have been very different, but, um, uh, but then we were like, oh, you know, it'd be much better if it was just like, she just meets her neighbors and like, she lives in this multicultural city. Um, and, uh, you know, she starts off, the book starts, the, the idea of the book is that like it starts off in her kitchen and then like she goes down the hall and then she goes like to the street and then she goes like a couple streets over. And so like, it's about her, like um, uh, the, in the book, like her neighbor, her, her sphere of food kind of expands. Um, uh, and as, and as it does that, she learns about different types of foods. Um, and then at the end, she brings it all back um, to her own home, um, which is sort of, not not the plot of the book, but that's sort of that was sort of the general outline of the book. <laughs> well, I, I think you know, I even though we we will talk about the walk because I do have a bunch of questions about that, but I do sure. love the refrain in that book of like, I know I don't need it, but I'll try it kind of idea and right, right, really right. getting kids it. to yeah. think about <laughs> that. That's an important part of that. So kind of switching back, so mm -hmm. the walk was originally I believe a chapter for what would be a second 
part of Food Lab and then kind of right. evolved into its own book. So, and then Food Lab is really one of the more famous parts is like this dissection of like how you can boil an egg and everything. Was there anything right. when you were looking at the walk that you're like, okay, this is my like hard boiled egg story? <laughs> <laughs> um, not so much, you know, the, the walk, the, um, you know, so yeah, it, it was originally going to be a chapter in the food lab um, that kind of, then when I started writing um, the second volume or what was going to be a second volume of the food lab, um, I started with the walk chapter because it was the one that I felt would be easy. Like I had the most to say. Um, and then that just started, yeah, that just grew and grew and grew and turned. And I was like, let's just make this a book uh, because there's so much to say about it. Um, you know, it, I feel like it's, it's, it's a pretty, it's similar to food lab in, in that it's, you know, techniques oriented, um, and that um, I try to be relatively broad as far as like this, the different types of dishes you can do um, and to really show you like, all right, if you learn this one technique, here are all the different things you can do with it. So it's similar to the food lab in that sense, but um, it's, it's, I think it's a fundamentally different book in that um, in the food lab, um, a lot of the recipes in there, um, you know, some, some of them are practical, but a lot of them are sort of there really to illustrate um, as many different principles of cooking as possible you know so there's like a recipe for meatloaf in there um that that takes like two days to make and you grind your own meat and you do all these different things um and you know it has like 40 ingredients and and you know that recipe uh i've never made it since i made that since i wrote the book um, <laughs> That's uh, great. you know the idea behind it is like all right like i'm going to show you everything like here i'm going to give you sort of a map of how to make meatloaf right and and this is everything that you can possibly see in, the, in this map. It's like an atlas with everything. Um, and now, um, you know, once you once you have that map, now you can choose like what route you want to take. So you can decide: Do I want to grind my own meat next time? Do I want to make this mm -hmm. um, this stock reduction to in, increase flavor? Whatever. All so there's all these things that are sort of optional techniques that are really there just to sort of illustrate um, some of the basic principles of cooking. Um, Whereas, uh, you know, in the walk, there's not, it, it, I don't do that as much because the, the walk is much more about like, all right, like here's this tool that I've used for, you know, I, I've used literally the exact same walk for like 20 something years, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I bought it when I was in college um, and I've used that exact same walk um, to like feed myself through college, to feed when I was single, when I was living with roommates, when I got married and now like with my family, right? And so it's this one tool that is extraordinarily useful and has all these different things you can do with it. Um, and so the, this book is much more about sort of highlighting that practicality. Um, and mm -hmm. so the recipes in this book, I, you know, I do expect that people will probably make them uh, verbatim, you know, or maybe, maybe, you know, wing it a little bit, but it, there, there's no, there's no equivalent of like a four day, a four, a four right. day long chili in this book. Um, <laughs> Got it. Um, because, because the recipes in this book, like all, all the techniques and stuff in this book are things that like I literally do multiple times a week. Um, so, uh, so, you know, so in many senses it is, uh, similar to the food lab in that, it, it, you know, I, I do talk about sort of the technique and a lot of the sort of scientific principles behind how different techniques work and why you do them certain ways. Um, but at the same time, the recipes are, are sort of intended mm -hmm. to be more, um, practical. So for the, you know, knowing like home cooks, maybe you're following the recipe very directly as opposed to, you know, thinking about techniques and putting things together with this book. You know, mm -hmm. how would you encourage someone at home to take those and like kind of put their own spin on it and feel like get the courage to make those changes? And <laughs> yeah, well, you know, so in 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 the in the different chapters in this book, um, I do you know I do try and sort of demonstrate a technique. So like if I show you how to make kanji, right, like a rice porridge, um, then there's like a half do a half dozen different flavor variations. But there's also like a big like two page chart that shows you like if you want like. If, you, if it's spring and you have asparagus, like here's here's how you can add it to your kanji. Right. If you have like a leftover head of lettuce, here's how you can add it to your kanji and how long to cook it for and whatever. So um, so in that sense, you know, I do give sort of basic outlines for like if you want to adapt to what you have in your fridge, here's how you do it. Um, but I but I really do think that, um, uh, you know, like something like a stir fry, it's like once you understand the basic process, like, all right, I'm going to cut my meat in this in, in one of these ways and then I'm going to cut my vegetables to match it. Um, I, I have my aromatics. I'm going to, you know, se separate everything into these bowls before I start cooking. I'm going to preheat my wok this way. Then I'm going to stir fry in batches. Um, and then I'm going to add myself, you know, there's, there's a, there's a process to it that is essentially the same from recipe to recipe. It's just the, the ingredients and some of the flavors might change. Um, 
Um, but once you understand that process, um, then it becomes, I think, relatively easy for you to, to realize like, oh, like, I don't need to use like uh, scallions here. I can use this red onion that I have and it's going right. to, you know, as long as I cut it into basically the same size and shape, it's going to cook sort of in the same way, you know. That um, one of the techniques that you talk about is the washing, the difference between washing the meat and not washing the meat and the difference. Right. It did, and and some I had never even really thought about that, and then I was right. like, oh, this makes more sense. And then I watched more videos, and I was like, you know, and I think that was that like something that you found out through working on this book, or like uh, I, I found that, that was out a real through surprise. watching YouTube videos <laughs> um, <laughs> and then trying it a lot at home. Um, uh, you know what? One of the th one of the, one of the things that has changed um, uh, since I you know when I start when I started learning how to cook um, versus now it's like when i when i started learning how to cook if i wanted to learn chinese food i had to buy a book on chinese cooking right and i and then i had like one person's sort of probably expert opinion on it but it was still just one person right um and um you know and then maybe i could go to a restaurant and if i was lucky i could ask them hey like show me how you do this in the kitchen and so usually people say yes when you ask them that um but still um you know these days it's like if i want to learn how to cook a specific Sichuan dish, I can like go on YouTube and right. find, you know, find people making it at home, people making it in restaurants. Probably I could find like people making it live right now. Right. Um, and so I, you have all this access to all these resources that you never had before. Um, so getting, you know, so the process of writing a, a book now or writing a recipe now is really different than it was when I started writing recipes. Um, uh, because now like getting idea, you, you know, the, the testing process and saying, all right, what does work? What doesn't? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to do this A-B testing, see what difference it makes. Like, that process is still the same, you know, and I still do a lot of that. But um, as far as access to ideas um, as, and and expert opinions on on techniques, um, that that is sort of vastly increased. But um, so, yeah, the idea of washing meat um, uh, is someone... You know, someone who grew, who, who my, you know, my, my cooking experience, my um, restaurant experience is all in, um, you know, mainly Western, you know, Western technique, a little bit of, a little, a, a little bit of, you know, Japanese, a little bit of other types of Asian, but definitely no, like I didn't have any restaurant experience cooking Chinese food or, um, um, which is where a lot of this, this sort of washing comes into place. And so, you know, I was always under the, the impression that like, okay, you like, I've seen, I've seen people say, wash your meat. I, you know, that seems maybe people used to do that because meat was, you know, because right. we didn't have as good refrigeration then as we do now or whatever. Maybe, you know, it seems one of those things that's just like a, a vestige of an older, um, of older times. But, um, but then when I saw, you know, I saw, Oh, modern chefs are still doing this. Okay. Like maybe I There's should. There's gotta be a reason. Yeah. 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 And so I, um, yeah. And so I tested and I tested various types of washing. I tested um, why it, 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 this didn't make it into the book, but there's an article that just went up on serious eats about, um, uh, dim sum style, um, spare rib, the steamed ribs. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, there's, um, there's restaurants that will, that wash those in these sort of giant machines that look like, um, like, uh, clothes dryers, like clothes. <laughs> washing clothes. Um, uh, and in fact, there are some places that will repurpose washing machines for clothes to wash them in. Um, and so, you know, and so I tested that, like I, I tested washing in a, in a countertop clothes, dry, a clothes washer. Um, I tested washing like by hand. And so all these different things that um, you test and you find out, oh, okay. So like washing is, is not, it, it, part of it is like, okay, like you, you, you get all the, um, the myoglobin and the minerals and stuff out of the meat that, that can cause it to sort of discolor as you're, um, as you're stir frying it, or particularly for something like steamed ribs where like you, where that, that really um, sort of pale, clean color is mm -hmm. um, prized. Like part of it is that, but it also makes like a huge difference as far as um, ability to absorb marinades go um, and also uh, texture, tenderness. So, um, you know, that, that sort of almost, that, that sort of really tender, almost slippery texture that you get with like, if you've had like, uh, like, like, beef chow fun from the takeout place right where, mm -hmm. where it's like how do they get how do they get this meat so tender and so yeah. like you know like has melting. like a soft quality yeah exactly it. um yeah. and that comes down to you know that comes down to well it's a couple techniques but a lot of it is down to um for, you know from from the testing i did it's like 90 percent of that is is very vigorously washing it i mean like putting so it in water and like squeezing and squeezing and squeezing like you're like you're wringing out clothes um 
Uh, and then, and then another part of that is sort of the, a, a, an alkaline marinade, um, which is which you know the alkaline marinade was what I had been reading is is the thing that really tenderizes it. But in the testing that I did, it actually it's actually the washing that has a much bigger effect than the alkaline marinade does. Um, and then and then some of it is pre-treating it. So like in a in a restaurant, you would um, pass it through oil first. So you'd have oil in your wok, or you might have a deep fryer, and you would very briefly like fry the meat. Uh, mm -hmm. before you stir fry it um i don't i don't generally do that at home but um but yeah those are all yeah techniques that yeah um, that it's funny because that when Western you say the washing culture. but it's not i mean look at think about it, it's like there's this uh there's a restaurant in new york that has like a bunch of washers for their octopus oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I, i'm sure you've heard of it before you know and yeah. that always i was like oh yeah of course that's what you do with an octopus yeah but actually, i never thought I, about doing it with a spare rib, rib. Um, <laughs> like, the spare rib article i meant yeah i mentioned that like I, yeah i worked in restaurants where we where we had octopus that came from washing machines that beat it up and tenderize it um yeah but it's, yeah, yeah it's, i it's, still it's, maintain it's, that taverna claudius is my favorite octopus hands down it's always yeah. the most tender. I, don't, it's I have so not delicious. had that. <laughs> <laughs> um, another Astoria type place. But um, yeah, so, okay. So we've gone through techniques and we've talked about, you know, some of the, what's the boiled egg? There's no boiled egg. We've got a different recipes. What about, you know, kind of thinking about this time and, you know, you've been show, showcasing, well, I don't know if you call it showcasing. You've been going to a lot of restaurants in Seattle yeah. and they're, uh -huh smaller places and a lot of them definitely fall into the lines of like oh yeah that looks like new york food in fact i think i saw an italian hoagie on there that was like i don't even think i can get one like that in brooklyn <laughs> and I, I, I went to another one i went to another one just now and picked up another <laughs> italian hoagie for lunch because I'm, I'm on this like hoagie quest right now <laughs> i mean there's a, you know what it's like a really under respected dish the italian hoagie <laughs> <laughs> well it depends what part of the country you're in i think it's in certain parts of the country it's very it's very well uh yeah. venerated um in new york where do you get a good where do you get a good hoagie i used to get i used to get italian subs at or italian heroes at um at parisi um, oh yeah parisi's a, yeah a bakery in um in in a, a little italy um but it's it's a little you know the, the italian the, the with, uh, in new york they call them heroes right i think that but um yeah. Um, there, the hoagies that you get from like Philly are, I think a pretty distinctly yeah. Philly thing. I, I mean, grew up going to the Jersey shore. So, you know, yeah. for us, yeah, 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 yeah. gotta have like lettuce that's sliced on a meat slicer, onions are sliced right. on a meat slicer, heavy on the oil, heavy on the oregano, right. those <laughs> kind of things. And, you know, that, and again, back to like, kind of how you're, how you grow up, all those things like that for me is like family in the summer is having that yeah. Italian home yeah, yeah, yeah. my mom and dad and you know now yeah. now but, with but my partner to... introducing him to that he's like what is I've been like, like I've never <laughs> had a sub before you know yeah I mean but to, to be clear I also think it's it's you know it's fun to find um like a good Philly style hoagie in Seattle right but I think it's also yeah. but, I, but I think it's good that 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 <laughs> Not every city has the same foods, right? You know, I, th I, yeah, I think totally. it's a good thing that you can't find this everywhere. That that um, people, you know, you have, they have different cities have their own distinct things, like yeah, like raw oysters everywhere in, in Seattle. Right. Or, um, you know, in in many ways, you know, Seattle reminds me a lot of um, you know, I, I lived in, I was born in Boston, and then I, but then I, I also lived there for ten years, like in college and afterwards, um, in Cambridge, um, and. Seattle um, reminds me a lot of Boston um, in the sense that it has, um, you know, it has like, it's a city and, it, and it, it's a pretty sizable city, but it still has like a very small town feel to it. Right. You know, it feels like easy to, it feels like easy to get to know people compared to like, say, New York um, and easy to get anywhere. It's like you can walk places or like um, there's reasonable public transportation, but you can walk or drive places and like, um, and, uh, and it doesn't feel overwhelming. And it's like, I, you know, I, 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 what I liked about living in Cambridge or Boston was like, I, you know, I don't need, um, I don't need like 10 great, um, bars around me. I just need like the one that I really like and I'm fine mm -hmm. just going there, you know, like I, I prefer to have like one bar that I become a regular at than, um, than to feel like, you know, when I lived in New York and especially like when I was, 
um, you know, writing about food in New York, where it's just like, I felt like it's constant pressure to like, uh, it's like a fire hose. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, like there's stop. so much new stuff. Like what the hell, like what's, what's going on? Like, that's how it, I like it, to it, describe. If Chicago you go to the same too. place twice, you feel like you're missing on, you're missing out <laughs> something on something else. else right? Totally. The idea of like some of the, like Chicago, I feel like that way is like you have, you know, Williamsburg or you have like Lincoln square or like Logan right. square, you know, you've got Lincoln square, you got park slope, but, but instead of having like park slope and a million other, Clinton Hill, all those places. Yeah. You just have the one. And you, right. you only need like a good <laughs> one. And that's, right. you know, kind of ways. So, Seattle, I have to mention my college roommate, Megan, is the one who gifted me your first book. And she lives in Seattle. And they know oh, cool. me, and she's super excited that I get to talk to you today. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, now that you're in Seattle, you know, and you're, you're kind of getting used to life there, you know, what do you, how do you think that's going to influence what you do next? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, we, we moved here ma because uh, we moved here mainly for the, you know, the, the lifestyle um, because we, you know, because we like, we wanted to, we wanted our kids to grow up in a city to have sort of this multicultural experience. Um, but also, um, you know, Seattle is, I think, pretty unique in, in as far as its access to nature goes, you know, it's like, um, like we live, we live in Capitol Hill. And so it's like, right by our house there's a park that's like you're like walking in like the woods and like et right it's like mm -hmm. ferns and trees <laughs> and there's like like i walked out the other day and there were like two bald eagles sitting on top of my garage um and there's great. like this little jerk woodpecker who wakes us up every morning but um but you have, you know you have that but then like we're 15 minutes from downtown um and then like an hour away from the mountains and like you know and then like like yesterday so thursdays is like my adventure days with my daughter i, I pull her to school mm -hmm. and we go on adventure days and like yesterday we um, we went to the aquarium in the morning and then like we got uh, we got a, a hoagie from the pizza place for lunch and then we went fishing in the afternoon. It's like that that feels like a pretty unique thing that, that mm -hmm. I couldn't have done like in New York. Right. Um, yeah, totally. Um, um, but anyhow, so the the, the, uh, oh, the question was, oh, how is Seattle going to influence what I work on next? Um, I mean, you, right now, you know, I feel like I'm in this very lucky position that, um, uh, you know, my books are continuing to sell well. Uh, and so, and, and I don't, you know, other than my sort of New York times gig, which I do once a month, um, I don't, I, you know, I don't have a boss, which is great, <laughs> which yeah. is something I've always <laughs> wanted in a career. Like every career move I've ever made was like to have fewer people to answer to. Um, and so, um, I don't know what I'm going to do next. You know, I, I'm, I'm obviously, I want to take some time off. Um, my son now is seven months old, so I want to spend a lot more time, uh, with, um, with the kids again. Um, and, uh, um, you know, eventually I, I, at some point I do want to, I think my next projects are going to be writing, um, a couple more children's books, uh, because I want to finish those before my kids are not children anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, um, and then, uh, I do also long-term want to work on a, a book about cooking with, um, cooking with kids. So not, not like a kid's cookbook, um, but a cookbook for parents who want to get their kids more involved in cooking and how to sort of teach your kids to, um, help in the kitchen um uh and uh i don't know eventually a mm -hmm. book on colombian food i think at some point just all sorts of things <laughs> so yeah but i don't know but, said... but this also like this all, all this might change like in, in of course next week who knows <laughs> so so you just said that you you've been trying not to have a boss but you're kind of yeah. famous for being a good one you know the idea I'm that like, there's no uh... hazing in your kitchen <laughs> you know, that oh. you, you know, those kind of things. And I think, you know, and as someone who has lots of friends in the food industry mm -hmm. in New York and, you know, you, everybody's right. Kitchen confidential and all the right, know, right, horror right. stories. Right. And I, I think we are at this point where like bad behavior is not tolerated and, you know, you've been really outspoken uh, yes. person on that. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily meet, say that makes me a good boss per se mm -hmm. i think um i you know i my restaurant um which i which i'm you know I, I left when i moved to seattle but my restaurant um that you know that was a strong policy in the beginning and um and continues to be now um was that um yeah we had these and we had our basic rules were um no no cursing in the kitchen no um uh no yelling and no uh like public dressing down like so which, mm -hmm. which happens a lot so um um those are the sort of basic rules of conduct in the kitchen, which I think a lot of kitchens should follow. But um, 
I, I wouldn't necessarily say that makes me good, but you know, I think I, I, <laughs> I did my best to set up a workplace that um, felt uh, encouraging and felt um, that that people felt comfortable in. And, and particularly, um, you know, I wanted a workplace where um, uh, women and minorities who, you know, very often have the short end of the stick in, in, as far as, you know, more traditional, like the type of restaurant culture I grew up in, which is this very sort of extremely macho, yeah. abusive type thing. Um, but, but particularly an environment where, um, you know, w women and minorities would feel um, comfortable working. Uh, um, so, you know, that in, 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 as much as that goes, I think I was a good boss. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know that I'm the best boss as far as, you know, like I'm, I, I don't <laughs> think I'm a very good manager. Like I, I, I tend to, I tend to, um, <laughs> yeah, there's a reason I try and <laughs> like, we don't need to go through. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to pressure you like, okay, now we're actually in the middle of performance review time and Kendra, I have yeah. a surprise for you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, um, you know, I, I am, I am very much the kind of person and especially, you know, like when I was at Serious Seats, I felt like I was a horrible boss because, you know, like one of the, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm very much the kind of person who it's like, if something needs to be done, like, I'm just like, ah, I'll just do it myself. Like, I don't, you know, like right. I'm, I'm very, I'm bad at delegating. I'm bad at. A, a lot of the things that make a good boss, like my wife is a very good boss, I think. Um, and actually, well, she was at Google. She's not there anymore. But um, I think my wife was a good boss and still is a good boss. But um, I'm not. I prefer I prefer working on my own. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, And I maybe you could say that, you know, the, the things that you put in place there will, won't necessarily make you a good boss, but they will definitely make you a bad boss if you don't do it. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, they, yeah. they are all things that I think yeah, contribute to a better workplace, you know, and, and, you know, one of the things I was very proud of at, at um, Worst Hall was that I mean, at least pre-pandemic, you know, once the pandemic hit and we had to close and all this stuff happened, but at least pre-pandemic, um, we had a virtually 100% retention rate um, among um, women cooks, um, which is, you know, even, even, you know, over the, over the three years that we, that we were open before the pandemic, um, which is, even even it, a cook in general, it's it's sort of unheard of to have that kind of retention, um, uh, because you know cooks yeah come and go a lot, but um, but we had a uh, um, yeah we had a very strong retention rate among uh, among women cooks, which I th I um, which I felt was sort of a um, yeah a victory Great sign. <laughs> as far as I far mean, as creating yeah. yeah it's creating a, a workplace that people wanted to be part of yeah totally. So um, I'm getting the note that we have 15 questions and how much time okay. do we have left? Should we move to those? Because I want to make sure we have time for Yeah, whatever, whatever you want. Does that sound good? <laughs> All right. Sure. Um, what do we got here? I think they're going to. Oh, here we go. First question for Kenji. Uh, I assume most of these questions will be for you and none of them for me. <laughs> so, um, I have a Power Flamer 160K blue wok burner like you. It's so hot that uh -huh. it easily burns the seasoning off the hot zone underside. It gets sooty. Any tips okay. to prevent the rust? Uh, yeah. Oh, well, so rust, so those are two, I think, two different questions. Um, so yeah, I mean, rust pre prevention. So what happens when, yeah, ru rust prevention is, is basically, um, all you have to do is make sure that you oil your wok after each use. So I would do that whether when I, whether I'm cooking indoors on a regular burner or outdoors. Um, so after you use the wok, wash it out in the sink, you know, rinse it out. If you need to, you can use soap. That's fine. Then dry it over a burner um, and then take a, a paper towel with a little bit of oil, rub it all over the inside surface and the outside surface. And then after that, you can take a clean paper towel, depending on when you're going to, if you're going to be using the wok every day, then you don't have to do the second part. But if you're going to be storing it for, you know, a week or more, then I would take a, a second dry, clean paper towel and just rub off um, the oil that you just put on there as if you're, as if you put it on by accident, like, so that you're leaving just the sort of thinnest coat. Otherwise the oil can reduce and turn sticky. Um, as far as the seasoning goes. Um, so um, one of the fundamental differences between, between a wok, between wok seasoning and seasoning on like a Western style skillet, like a cast iron skillet or a carbon steel skillet um, is that with a, with a Western style, style skillet. Um, so, okay. So seasoning, there's two things that go on, right? There's you're, you're building um, first, you're, first there's black oxide, which is the reaction of the, of the, um, the iron and oxygen uh, under heat, right? And, and it, gives the, it gives the inside of the wok or this carbon steel pan or whatever, it turns it black. Um, whereas, you know, the, 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 raw, um, the raw carbon steel will be either sort of blue or sort of uh, grayish silvery. Um, so it'll turn it black. That's the first step of seasoning. Um, and then with the Western style skillet, um, what the other part of seasoning is when you build up polymers. So where you're, 
heating up oil. Um, and the oil breaks down and it forms these layers of polymers that over time will get thicker and thicker. Um, that's relatively easy. I mean, it's not super easy, but it's relatively easy to do in a, uh, a cast iron skillet or a carbon steel skillet because um, those pans are designed for relatively even heating. So when you when you heat them up, you get um, uh, your, your, your goal is to sort of get relatively eating, even heating all over, whether you're searing or sweating or whatever. Um, uh, and, and then whereas with a wok, um, typically you're trying to heat the bottom very hot. And then because the sides are wide and flare up like that, the sides are going to be cooler. So you get this differential um, uh, expansion of metal, right? So the bottom is going to be expanding more than the edges. And that actually makes it harder to build up these layers of seasoning, because if you try and build them up, they'll they'll flake off because of the way the metal expands. Um, and moreover, in a wok, like you're very frequently, you're going to be deglazing with um, wine or soy sauce or vinegar, or some of these acidic ingredients that um, actually make it really difficult to build up those polymers. So with a wok, um, you generally don't have to build up polymers. Um, and, and your goal shouldn't be to do that because they're going to generally end up flaking off anyway, um, or deglazing off, uh, or, or if you're using a power, you know, 160,000 BTU burner, they're going to end up burning off. Um, so, uh, my advice is don't worry about that. Like if, if the, if the, if it looks like the seasoning is burning off, like don't worry about that. Um, if it's getting really sooty, that's probably an indication that you are leaving too much oil in there when you, um, when you're done cooking with it. Uh, so just, you know, make sure you wipe off the oil as well as you can with a, with a dry towel afterwards. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be getting sooty per se. Um, yeah. So with, with a wok, the seasoning is really much more of a sort of per use, um, process. It's, it's, it's a little confusing because we use the same word seasoning, whether, whether we're talking about woks or Western skillets, but they're, um, they're sort of fundamentally different processes. Um, in fact, I mean, we should probably have a different word for, for seasoning yeah. and, um, that, uh, so that we don't have this confusion, but, um, but yeah, with a wok, like the, the initial seasoning is important, getting that, you know, cl cleaning off the sort of machine oil coating that the wok comes shipped in, um, scrubbing that off and then, and then heating it. So you build that layer of, um, so, so that the metal turns black, uh, that part, that initial seasoning is important. But after that, like, you know, like I have a wok that, uh, I got just for when I do book events, you know, cause I, I went on like a little tour. And so I was traveling with this wok that I bought just for, um, brand new just for these events. Um, and so at this point, I've used it probably nine or 10 times. But even like the second time I used it, I was doing live events with it. Like, um, and the, the second time I use this wok, it, it, it's seasoned enough that you can, um, okay. you know, you can, you can fry an omelet in it without it sticking as long as you preheat it properly, um, which, you know, which you typically wouldn't try to do in a, in a cast iron or carbon steel pan because it's a, a different seasoning process. Yeah, I hope that was. I don't know. I don't know if that was the the answer. The, the I don't know if it was exact question, but... but it was very helpful for me. I didn't know that, and <laughs> you know, I think I do. I have a cast iron skillet that I season myself, and it's like one of my like prized possessions, right? Yeah. But the walk <laughs> is like, you know, it is different. It's it yeah, feel, you it gets know, banged like, around a lot more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and definitely, yeah. and it's uh, the idea like. I myself have seen it, you know, peeling off the side. I'm like, is that supposed to go that way? I don't know. It's yeah. <laughs> like, you know. All right. What's our next question? And again, tips on practicing wok tossing. I see some chefs use wok chon to push food up uh -huh. on the sides before tossing. Some don't. Um, so, you know, practicing wok tossing, it's, it's, it's just, it's just like practicing <laughs> anything. You just kind of got to do it. Um, in the book, I recommend, um, practicing with, with, uh, like dry beans, you know, get some, put some dry beans in there. Um, and then you can, um, just practice the motion. Um, that said, like, if, if you feel like you're not going to get to the, you, you don't care about getting to the point where you can toss extremely well, um, you can definitely like use your spatula to, um, you know, what you, what, what you don't want to do is stir, like, so stir fries are called stir fries, but they shouldn't really be, they should be called sort of toss fries or, or <laughs> fold fries, because you're not, you shouldn't, you should never be stirring like this. You know, you could be, you could put the, the, the special pointing down and kind of, um, as you're, as you're tossing, use it to help mo move stuff in the air. But if you do, if you don't even want to do that, like you can, you can take the sort of shovel side of the spatula and get underneath, you know, very, put it, put it underneath your food and then lift it and flip it over and do and do it like that, like where you lift and flip. Um, and that and that you can get a reasonably good approximation of stir frying. Um, you know, the goal of stir frying is to 
get food moving through the air so that you're encouraging evaporation. So you're, you're, you're get, getting everything to sort of tumble over itself so that everything cooks evenly, you know, because everything's cut into sort of bite-sized pieces already and you want everything to cook quickly and evenly. But part of that quick process, part, part of what makes it quicker is the fact that um, you're able to get moisture to evaporate so easily and so quickly in a walk. And that's like one of the advantages of, of being able to toss in a walk, um, that the more you move things through the air and the more convection you have going on, the more moisture um, you're, the more you're encouraging moisture to evaporate away. And so the faster um, you're going to concentrate flavors. Um, and so, th you know, so that's really your goal. You should, you want, whether you're tossing with your hand or whether you're using your spatula to sort of lift and, and toss and, and tumble the food, um, you want the food to be in the air um, a lot. Um, you know, the, the, the only, there's a couple, there's a couple of dishes in the book um, and a couple of dishes that are, that are sort of like famously difficult um, as far as the stir frying process goes. So like, like beef chow fun, right? So um, chow fun and the hor fun are the are the noodles, these um, um, steamed rice noodles that are then stir fried in soy sauce. Um, and they're relatively sticky uh, and they're also relatively tender. So if you try and scoop them too much with the spatula, you end up breaking them into pieces. Um, and so, yeah. you know, so that's one of those dishes where really great Cantonese chefs um, will not even use a spatula. They'll put it in and they'll do do all the motion just by stirring the wok so that everything tumbles but nothing gets a, a, you know nothing gets hit with a sharp metal edge um you don't have to do it that way but you know that's one of those issues where it's like you probably want to practice uh, that like that's probably the most difficult recipe in the book right um and then there's a couple of you know something like um something like mapo tofu where um you're it's it's a simple dish you know the the process is really easy um and if you don't if you're not too particular about the end result you can use a spatula you can stir whatever you want um but it's also, it, but, but the tofu in that dish is typically cut into little cubes um, and it's a very soft tofu. Um, and so if you use a spatula, you're going to end up breaking some of it apart. Um, uh, and so, you know, and, and my mom did it that way. Like she made it, she made it, she stirred it with a wooden spoon. And so it, um, we called it Mapo, Mapo Gorp because it had this kind of gorpy <laughs> texture um, because the tofu would break up and, and it's fine. It's still going to taste delicious, right? It's still going to taste delicious, yeah. but if you want to get that like sort of real sort of restaurant quality, perfect cubes of tofu, once you add the tofu, like you, you basically don't want to get the spatula in there very much because the spatula is going to break it up. So you do, that's one of those issues where once the tofu is in there, you kind of want to practice tossing it by hand. Um, but um, yeah, all that said, like, you know, th those types of dishes that are, I think more of the exception than the rule. Um, and and even if you, even if you don't get the, the tossing perfect, they're still going to be good to eat. And I might humbly add from my own experience when I can't toss it, it's usually because I put way too much stuff in the wok. That, yeah, that's that's true. like, <laughs> it's filled because I was like, this is not going to turn out the way it's supposed to turn yeah. out. But if you've seen, if you've seen like the, there's like YouTube videos of like, you know, people cooking like, Oh, with the thing that they're like fried rice their in the whole street and the, and the rice is like <laughs> filled, yeah, filled all the way to the brim and they're still like shaking it and not dropping a single a single grain. <laughs> I cannot do that. <laughs> yeah, that's not me. No. <laughs> All right. Next question. Jackson, huge fan of your work. Do you ever get concerned about the and smoke you and y'all? <laughs> I live in a kitchen with not great. Uh, and that is, yeah, I'm in New York too. And I am yeah. thousand percent real to this question. I would love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> um, I, well, I live, you know, I, I lived, when I first started writing the Food Lab column on Serious Seats, I lived in a, uh, in an apartment. My wife and I lived in an apartment in, in Prospect Heights that was, uh, that had no windows, like literally zero windows. Uh, and so, you know, when I, when I was cooking, I was cooking in a walk then, and I was also like testing, you know, I, I had this column called the burger lab where I was cooking burgers all the time. So the place just always smelled like a, like a fast food slash Chinese restaurant. <laughs> but, um, um, when I, you know, what, what we did then was we cracked open the door to the hallway and then just pointed had like one of those very powerful, um, uh, the, the little black, the, the Vornado. Oh, the Vornados. That, yeah. That does like yeah. a, the really powerful column of air. Um, and so basically, like, I would just put that next to the stove and point it where I wanted to go. And then later we moved into an apartment that did have windows. Um, and my strategy there, um, in New yeah, because New York, the ventilation is generally terrible in kitchens, especially the small galley kitchens, which is, you know, what I grew up cooking in and what I, and what I cooked in for years when I lived in New York. But, um, yeah, I would take one of those little little portable fans, put it on the stovetop next to the wok, point, you know, point a column of smoke towards the window and then put another fan in the window that would point it out. Um 
that would that would be my general advice. But you know, the other the other thing is like just pick recipes that don't necessarily have that crazy high heat. And that you know, and um, a lot of the a lot of the recipes in this book. So so the ones that you know the, the recipes that that require um, or that call for wake like that smoky that smoky flavor like those you're generally going to have smoke right that that that's just sort of the nature of it um, and then also some recipes that where you where you have um, a ton of dried chilies that you're going to be toasting or frying like those are going to put like chili or you know like uh, must you know, chili chili <laughs> chili gas in the air that um, that you you do want to have like a fan or relatively good ventilation first so if you absolutely can't have ventilation just like don't do those recipes because most of the other recipes it's like you'll turn on your wok you you let it preheat until it's just it's just starting to smoke you know and then once you add your food all the smoking should go away because the um, the temperature is going to drop down again um, so as far as like the actual volume of smoke created I find you end up getting a lot more smoke when you're say like searing a steak or you know or roasting a spatchcock turkey at a high temperature and you're letting it sit there for like seven minutes in a pan on 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 super high blast and you want that really hard searing to take place whereas in a wok um the smoke comes early on but it very quickly dissipates because you're going to be adding a bunch of ingredients that cool it down and in a wok typically you're not also you know the, the idea of searing and this and getting this hard crust hard dark brown crust and like a maillard reaction like that's much more something that you do in western cooking um than you do in in stir fry dishes you know most in stir fry dishes most of the color um as well as the, the more sort of um, the you know umami and the, the the complexity that you get in dishes comes much more from the sauces you add, um, you know. So like bean paste and these long fermented sauces that have all these um, dark colors and umami flavors built in. Um, you're not you're not typically um, you know like if you're doing a beef stir fry, you're not typically searing the beef in the same way that you would for um, like when you're cooking a steak, you know, like a a western style steak. So I find that um, in a wok you actually end up with um, less smoke than a lot of a lot of western techniques. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the galley kitchen is a something that I suffer through as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you go through it, you're like, maybe this fan will work, or maybe this other fan if I turn yeah. it backwards, or I add a <laughs> it's like the best I've found is like you have to get like an air purifier and then a, like a good breeze and <laughs> yeah. Hope. Also make sure and that you clean it. your I think one thing a lot of people don't do. So um whether you have a vent that you know that exhausts outside or just one of those circulating vents like under your microwave which is what most new york kitchens have i think um those um the filters um make sure you clean your vent hoods and your filters like most vents they have a, a metal fil a metal oil filter that pops out um and you can just like run it through your dishwasher or wash it in the sink um because i've been to many people's houses um where they didn't know that you have to do that especially people who rent like they didn't know that you, you can take things out and that you're supposed to then you and you walk in and you see like oh there's like you can literally see like the oil droplets that are like about to fall down onto the food um and so those things when if if you're running them right you're basically just taking all the oil that's already stuck in them and blowing it out into your kitchen um so yeah make sure you keep your <laughs> keep your um your vent uh filters clean i feel like that's like a fire safety type answer as that well. too, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next question. Kanina, uh, is there a wok holder you recommended for a standard gas range? I rent an apartment and use a cast iron holder for my round bottom wok, but the wok moves around a lot. Yeah. Um, well, so I, I would, I would honestly just recommend a, um, a, a flat bottom wok for Western style ranges um, because um, yeah, most, you know, like wok rings and stuff, they there there's some that there's some that have like little clips that will keep them in place on top of your grate. But the problem with, with the problem with most wok rings um, and using a round bottom wok anyway is that um, you end up elevating your wok further from the flame than you need to. And and um, so so you're already you're taking a flame that's probably already relatively you know not most apartment ranges are not that strong. Um, and then you're moving the the moving the wok even further away from that flame. So um, that, that's why I typically you know recommend getting a flat bottom wok if you're cooking on a on a unless you have like a specifically a wok range um I, I would recommend a flat bottom wok because that's going to keep it stable it's also going to get it closer to the flame um, um and especially if you're doing something like you know braising or or, or deep frying in a wok like you want it to be you want it to be stable yeah um so you don't want to you don't want to run the risk that you're going to tip it over which can happen with a round, round bottom wok in the restaurant range if you already have a round bottom wok then uh, 
I, I don't have any specific brand recommendations, I'm afraid. Next. Oh, there we go. Uh, hello, Kenji, longtime fan. Best wishes to your entire family and hopefully your wife rejoins Google in the future. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope you're on hot one soon. When, if you're too tired, when is your, what is your go-to meal? <laughs> um, if I'm too tired to cook, my go-to meal is to order out. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I don't think my wife is going to be rejoining Google, um, unfortunately. Um, not not because she didn't enjoy it there, but I think it's just it's it's too big for her now. <laughs> she she prefers working at a smaller company. But um, uh, I probably will do hot ones at some point. I was supposed to do it a couple of years ago, and then. Uh, um, I can't remember why we canceled, but I think we canceled at the last minute because of some kind of scheduling conflict and then never rescheduled it because the pandemic came and blah, blah, blah. But at some point I'll do hot ones. Um, uh, and, uh, my go-to meal to cook at home would be, um, my mom's mapo tofu. It takes like 10 minutes to do. Um, it's like pantry staple. You know, once, if you, as long as you have like, um, you know, I always have tofu at home in like Tetra packs and I always have the soy sauce smear and, um, sake stuff like that. Um, and so the only real ingredient that, um, that I need to buy fresh typically would be ground beef, but I usually also keep that in like, um, um, cryovac bags sort of flat in my mm -hmm. f frozen flat in the freezer. So they, they thaw out and like, you put them on an aluminum tray, uh, and they thaw out in like 15 minutes. Oh, that's, that's a tip by the way, if you want to, if you want to oh, freeze yeah. or thaw things fast, um, it'll, if you put, uh, if you have like an aluminum baking sheet, and you put something and you freeze things flat. If you put them on the aluminum baking sheet, they will thaw out like 75% faster than if you just put them on the countertop or like a wooden cutting board or something because aluminum is a great conductor of heat. So it'll spread out the heat and it'll get into the kitchen. Anyhow, um, uh, so that, yeah, that would be my go-to thing because it takes 10 minutes to do. And I know that like my daughter will always eat it. So um, mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good one. The Flat packing of the meat is a really good, also, if you have a small New York kitchen, small free, free freezer yeah. situation, that yeah. Yeah. that will be something I'm taking home because yeah. when I, when I lived in New York, about we the had size like... of an ice cream box. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we had like a side-by-side -side, um, fridge and freezer. Um, and so flat packing things, like whether we would do like soup, we would do ground meat, you put it in like a Ziploc bag and you, and you squeeze it flat and then you squeeze all the air out, but then you can... You can file it in there like um like a like a record collection you know yeah <laughs> on, on those, at least on those side those side freezes that makes it really easy to pull things out awesome next question rachel my three-year-old daughter is a huge fan of your book every night is pizza night any recommendations to get kids to try things they say are yucky or they haven't tried yet hmm um well well first of all like we so at, at least at my house like nobody's allowed to use the word yucky um because like it's okay to not like something but we don't call it yucky because that that implies that like it's like this well i don't know we, we find it like you know what 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 might be good to what might what you might not like might be good to someone else and also you know the thing the thing we do with my daughter um and i'm not gonna be able to give a very quick answer because i think this is a relatively long um a long question like there's a lot of strategies that you can take but um, one of the things we do um, with my daughter is that um, we stress that like it's okay to not like things and it's also more importantly like it's okay to like people change over time you know so mm -hmm. it's like if today you don't if you don't if you if you don't like peas today you, like try it maybe you don't like peas today that's fine um, and you don't have to eat peas today like we we make sure that she has um, you know we, we think about her sort of nutrition on a uh on like sort of like a week-long schedule as, as opposed to like my mom was very much like a here's your here's your plate you finish everything that's on it you need to eat these things these specific things um uh, and you can't leave the table till you're done with that um wh whereas um for us it's like if she wants to only eat a um only eat like lettuce today or only eat salmon tomorrow or whatever like as long as over the course of a week she's getting like a wide variety of foods um that's okay so we we generally like present at meal times, we present a bunch of things. She can pick what she wants to eat, um, uh, and then if she, you know, and then we just sort of keep a loose eye on on what she's eating over the course of amount of time. Um, but then, as far as like foods that are uh, that she doesn't like, um, you know, what we tell her to say instead of saying like I don't like this, we we teach her to say like Hey, like I don't like this today, but I might like it, but I might like it next week. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that way she 
keeps an open mind to it and and she and and it reminds her like oh next week i might be a different person and like i might actually like this thing if i try it again um and so that that generally seems to have worked um the only yeah the only foods that she consistently doesn't like are um cilantro uh raw cilantro which i think is understandable like my wife also hates raw cilantro and uh uh i think that's about it there's like yeah, she she goes through phases of not liking things, certain things, um, and you, and like for me, it's like, yeah, that's okay. Like sometimes I don't feel like eating certain things either, and I and yeah. I'm a grown up, so I get to choose not to eat those things. Like, <laughs> you know, kids kids, kids want to feel, kid like I think, yeah, kids are you know kids are like small grown ups. They they want to feel that their opinions are respected, and they want and they want to have some sort of level of control over their own lives and their own bodies. And yeah. So I we I try to encourage that. I think it's a really good message too, though, that you can change, right? Like I might not like it today, but I might like it tomorrow. And that can go yeah. for a lot of things, right? You know, yeah. I, this music or this book or, yeah. or even yeah. what I think I want to be when I grow yourself. up. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And like I, like I, you know, like my, my daughter right now, she, you know, she, she plays violin and she hates it. Right? She, 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 she practices <laughs> 15 to 30 minutes a day and she hates it. And like, I did the same thing when I was a kid and I hated it. And I didn't start liking it until I was like, you know, thir- I didn't start loving music until I was, a teenager um and so you know so that's what i tell my daughter it's like yeah i know it's really hard like i i i felt the same way when i was five and i was learning how to play violin it was really hard um and um yeah you know some there are going to be things <laughs> that you do in life that are going to be hard but like you you know and then but later on when you're an adult you can you that's when you can decide for yourself whether you want to keep doing them or not but um yeah it's hard mm-hmm. sorry <laughs> <laughs> life's tough kid oh well yeah. <laughs> it's tough for me too yeah <laughs> see what the next question is welcome kenji planning to buy an actual carbon steel walk but it would be but would it actually be any benefit on a standard gas range okay similarly yeah i tend to use cast iron and uh or steel cotty sorry i don't know yeah yeah, yeah. For um gas. yeah so the the short answer is yes um so this is you know this is something that um i years ago actually when i was at, still at cooks illustrated so this must have been like 2005 or 6 um i did um uh, a series of tests there where we essentially cooked the same recipes in a wok side by side with a um a stainless steel skillet and a, and a cast iron skillet um and um uh yeah the, i mean the 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 flavor that you get out of a wok is fundamentally different um and i think it it comes down to um that rapid you know that encourage the ability to toss and the encouraging of of really rapid um evaporation and getting sort of more concentrated flavors and drier flavors and less sort of steaming um so well while you can um a lot of dishes you can successfully do in a skillet um and if you're not you know if you're not tasting it side by side you're probably also going to be fine with the results um that said like if you have the space for a walk and you want and you're so inclined to get one um you will um, almost definitely notice uh, an improvement in flavor if you switch over to using a wok, um, uh, mainly just because you're going to be able to, um, yeah, concentrate that flavor better, get 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 a dry heat better than you can uh, in a skillet. Um, so uh, yeah, so the, so the short answer is like if you if you live in a small New York apartment or whatever where, wherever you live, if you live in a small apartment and you don't have the space for a wok, then use what you have, um, and that's fine. Uh, but I do encourage you to at least try it sometime. It's kind of like it, we seem to have a, a few New Yorkers on the uh, stream. What do you so for a small apartment? Yeah. What kind of you know utensils or tools do you think are like just critical and you cannot live without? For me personally, I, I mean, as far as a why, I mean, I, I would say um, uh, so. The the tools I used by far the most when I lived in a small New York apartment were a walk. Um, mm-hmm. and a Dutch oven, um, and then probably one, uh, like three quart saucier, you know, like a three quart round bottom, um, pan. Those are the pans I, I use most. And then those are the pans I actually still use probably most now. Um, but, um, you know, a, a walk is, is for me, it's like a walk is an easy choice. Um, and of course it depends on what kind of cuisine you like, right? It's like, if you cook a lot of like, you know, French braises, then get a Dutch oven, don't get a walk. But, um, but, it, but if you want like a tool that's going to, give you a, a practical approach to cooking a huge variety of dishes, right? It's like the book, you know, this book is, um, 
however many hundred pages long, 600 something pages long. Um, and there's only, out of every recipe in that book, there, um, there's only one that, I, th I think there's only one that calls for even like heating the oven. Everything else literally mm -hmm. one wok or maybe one wok plus a side pan, but like a one wok, one pan on the stove top. Um, and, and as far as like the other tools go, it's like you, a wok spatula, a ladle, a lid and a bamboo steamer. Um, and that's like, that's basically it. Those are those with, with those few tools and a bunch of, and a bunch of cheap metal bowls, right? Like mixing bowls and stuff. Right. But with those few tools, like you can cook virtually everything that's in this book. Um, uh, and so, you know, so that, that, I mean, that was sort of part of the reason I wrote this book was that it's this like tool that I've found extremely useful in my own life. Um, and, uh, um, so, you know, I think the, the, the practicality of it um, and and um, especially, you know, if you're, if you're just starting to get into cooking, it's like, you know, buying a Dutch oven, you, you can get like an inexpensive one. But like if you're, if you're going to buy a de decent Dutch oven, it's like a two hundred dollar investment. Right. Or if a decent yeah. set of like of um, of uh, Western style skillets that aren't just like, you know, the like a, the, the thinnest piece of aluminum with uh, nonstick coating. If you're getting if you're getting like, a you know, like a tri ply skillet or a set of them, that's like a few hundred dollar investment, you know, whereas like a walk in a spatula is maybe 60, 70 bucks at most. And you can do like virtually, you know, everything in the book with those two things. That's great. So I think we're at time and I just want to thank you so much for spending this time with us. It's been great. Um, oh, yeah. I really love hearing about your story and your fa family and just especially like I was saying before, we have our mixed DRG, like hearing from someone who's really putting that out mm -hmm. in the world really feels very <laughs> validating. It's nice to see your face someplace else, right? Yeah. Um, and congratulations on the book. It's fantastic. Um, oh, thank you. So, well, thanks everybody. Thanks for your participation. Yeah, thank you for me. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't answer all your questions. But, um... <laughs> um, I'm looking and I see that there's 61 questions. So <laughs> oh yeah, we, we won't That's, get there's all a those. lot. We, this would be a very long <laughs> toxic Google. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh yeah maybe maybe i'll do like a i'll do a i'll do a uh an ama on reddit sometime soon or, or maybe I'll, I'll make sure to <laughs> send it out all around all right <laughs> great thank you so much all right thank you all right take care bye-bye